So, uh, first of all, I wanted to thank um, AWS and the organizers for inviting me. Uh, and uh, I'm Ron Alperin, and I'm uh, affiliated with all these departments that some of the chairs, what? Some of the chairs and the deans are here, so it's uh, uh, probably more chairs and, and deans that I had in any, in any of my <laughs> talks, basically. Um, and my lab is working on a few things, and I'm going to talk about some of the things today. Uh, one of the things that we're actually going to use, uh, we're planning to use uh, um, the cloud computing from uh, AWS is uh, things that I'm not going to talk about today, which are more related to anesthesiology, so basically prediction of surgery outcomes. Today I'm going to talk about uh, genomics, and um, uh, I'm really glad that Kelsey started with uh, uh, Ramon in Cajal in his kitchen, and the first thing that I think about uh, the kitchen when I look at the Spanish kitchen is basically a Spanish, Spanish food. So I'm actually going to start with Spanish food. It's a complete coincidence, by the way. I didn't know that she had it, that slide. Uh, and uh, so this is gazpacho, for those of you who don't know. So this is a, a Spanish soup cold soup. Uh, and the way you make it, you basically take uh, the tomatoes, the cucumbers, and all, all of these ingredients. You put them together. You just blend them. And it's uh, very tasty. So, um, and what you get is essentially this. And uh, one thing that you have to know is exactly which tomatoes you should put in and which cucumbers and so on. So uh, I'll tell you kind of, I'll start with a story. I basically I uh, went to a, a dinner party and I made gazpacho and I made it, uh, and so I went to the supermarket and I bought my favorite tomatoes, which are heirloom tomatoes and uh, yellow heirloom tomatoes. And then there was someone Spanish in the uh, dinner and uh, she, she tasted it and she said, what is it? And so, you know, I told her it's gazpacho, but something is wrong, right? So it's not exactly gazpacho. Uh, and I told her, you know, how I made it. and. I said that I used uh, uh, heirloom tomatoes, and she told me that you don't use heirloom tomatoes for gazpacho. So basically, the, uh, the message is that when you take this, when you only see this gazpacho here, uh, or when, you, when she saw the, the gazpacho that she looked at, she somehow was able to know that it's, it's off. It's not exactly made from the typical uh, tomatoes that people are using uh, for gazpacho. This kind of problem that we have, that we see here, or this kind of uh, uh, sense that basically of looking at kind of the mix of everything and trying to figure out what's inside, if it's heirloom tomatoes or Roma tomatoes, uh, that's a problem or an issue that we see in genomics all the time, or in biology all the time. Basically, in many cases, what we get is a gazpacho, or we basically get a mix of things, and we try to find out what is it made of. It's made of tomatoes, it's made of cucumbers, it's made of garlic, and so on, and maybe which type of tomatoes. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about uh, two, I'm going to tell you two stories uh, that are related to these kind of uh, uh, mixture problems. So basically, again, just think about this gazpacho and, uh, or, or any kind of mix, and we're trying to kind of understand what are the parts that, that make this mix. And the first story that I'm going to tell you uh, is related to, uh, to blood or basically any uh, heterogeneous tissue that, uh, that is composed of many cell types. So if you think about, uh, I'm, I'm giving here blood as an example, but that's true probably for all the, the tissues uh, in your body or most of them, that uh, you have multiple cell types that, compo that, that the tissue is composed of. So if you think about blood, there's, uh, first of all, there's red blood cells and there's white blood cells, but inside the, uh, the white blood cells you have multiple types of cell types. And uh, when you take the blood and you do sequencing or you any, any kind of measurements, uh, genomic measurements that you take, except for genetic one, for just the DNA, uh, DNA just is, stays the same in all of your cells. Uh, but any other thing, or I guess most of the things are going to be very uh, different between the different cell types. So um, one of these measurements that people take is uh, methylation. And methylation is basically when you think about your DNA, uh, your DNA has uh, the AGCT or kind of the building blocks of your uh, DNA sequence. And that's, again, going to be the same for every uh, cell that you'll take. But in some cases, uh, or in some positions in the genome, you're going to have these changes in the DNA or modification. And there's different types of modification. One of them 
is called methylation. So basically, that's a methyl group that is added to the, uh, to the DNA in certain positions. And uh, that would be different, from different between different cells. What happens is that in, in a given cell type, there is kind of a pattern uh, of, or kind of a typical pattern of which methylation sites are going to be, uh, which positions are going to be methylated and which positions are not. So methylation is really, uh, was re found to be really important in many different uh, um, facets of, base of what we study, and it's related to uh, different uh, diseases. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a couple of diseases uh, today. Uh, but it also captures some things that are related to, uh, for instance, demographics. So uh, this figure here on the right is a figure from Steve Horvath's uh, paper. Steve Horvath is a faculty in human genetics at UCLA. And he had uh, a few really nice papers about the relation between age and methylation. And what you can see here is that basically I can take the, a sample of your DNA of you know, blood or actually any other tissue and tell you how old you are up to an era of maybe a year. Uh, so, uh, but you can also look at smoking and uh, uh, you can, there's different differences obviously between women and men. Uh, there's uh, things that are related to, uh, uh, to other things. So for, for instance, smoking, if the mother smokes uh, during the pregnancy, then the child child's uh, uh, methylation is different. Uh, so there's a lot of things you can measure when you look at methylation, which are uh, potentially interesting in terms of when you look at applications for health or for biology. One of the important things is that methylation is relatively inexpensive to measure. And so that's why there's uh, larger and larger studies that are looking at it. So in terms of data that we get, we get basically a matrix. And that matrix is, uh, you can think about the, uh, the rows are just the individuals, and the columns are just going to be sites, so positions in the genome. Just the way it me it's measured is that typically we have a few hundred thousand. Uh, right now, it's about 800,000 sites that we're looking at at any given uh, study. Uh, and the number of individuals depends on your study. And then the numbers, the entries that you have here, are numbers between 0 and 1 that will tell you what is the fraction of methylation that you have in, uh, in that position for that individual in your sample. <coughs> so one of the, of the basic things that you're trying to do with methylation is correlate methylation to disease or to any phenotype. So it could be, doesn't have to be disease, but in typically that's, that's what people do. And uh, one of the basic ways of doing this is just using regression. So you can think of Y as the phenotype vector. Just, that just tells you what's your, if you think about, let's say, cholesterol level, that's what's your cholesterol level. Uh, and then uh, MJ uh, is going to be the jth position in the jth column in that matrix. And X is what we call fixed effects. This could be things like age uh, and sex and, uh, or other things that we know that are related to the, to the phenotype. Uh, and then we just do a simple uh, regression, and we try to find alpha and beta and, and uh, do hypothesis testing to see if that methylation site is, is related to the disease. The problem with this, if you just apply it this way, uh, is that you basically could easily find uh, erroneous results. Um, so. This is a typical problem in statistics, right, of, of confounders that you think that the result is because of one thing, but it's actually because of another thing. So let me give you an example of, or actually the, the kind of the main problem that we have in methylation in terms of confounders. So the main confounders in, in methylation studies is cell type composition, which brings us back to the soup. Um, so think about the case that you have cases and controls, so people that have a disease, people that don't have the disease. Uh, and then let's say that I'm looking at a specific methylation site here, and 60%, typically 60% of the uh, cases will have methylation in that posi position, and 40% of the controls will have methylation in that position. Now, that sounds like this gene or this position is somehow related to the disease. And, and it's true that it's somehow related, but the question is if there's anything interesting biologically to say about this. Now. In this example here, let's say that there's two different cell types. 
and one, in one of the cell types, all the methylation sites are always, all, all this position is always methylated, and in the, other met, uh, in, a, in the other cell type, none of them is methylated. There's never a case where they're methylated. So really what you see is that there is a difference, the 60% and 40% is a difference in the cell type composition, which is also interesting because then you may, uh, you may know that there is a difference in cell type composition between the different, uh, uh, between cases and controls. But in many cases, this is actually known. And even if it's not known, it's not that gene specific gene. It's basically just the, fa the fact that you have difference in between the, these different uh, cell types. So that, that's something that we kind of want to remove. We want to basically say, OK, we want to look for genes that are related to this phenotype, but that they are not due to the difference in the cell type composition. So this is kind of a, a, a schematic <coughs> figure that basically explains what, what do we have here. We have correlation between the disease and the cell type composition. We have correlation between the methylation level in that position with the cell type. And therefore, we have correlation between disease and methylation level. Okay, but what we really are interested in are correlation between methylation level and disease, where the setup composition is not really affecting us. And one way to do this is to add, uh, to account for this, is to add the cell type composition into the regression model. So I can basically add this to the matrix X and make uh, just add those as uh, um, fixed effects. The problem is that in most studies and I would say in 99% of the studies, cell counts are not given. You don't have those. And it's, uh, when I just started uh, looking at this a few years ago, I, wasn't, I, I couldn't understand this because it's not, uh, at least for blood, it's not so uh, expensive to do this. But there are some logistical reasons that, uh, that basically this happens because of those. Sometimes it's just because people didn't think about it when they did a study. Uh, but once you freeze the, the samples, then you can't basically do this. And so people freeze them before they, to, uh, they take the cell, count, uh, the cell counts. And sometimes they, uh, they go and collect the samples somewhere else. They freeze them, and then they do the analysis. And so uh, for various reasons, it's not, it's not there in most studies. So we and others basically thought about how, how can you estimate this. So this is, again, Going back to the gazpacho, we have the gazpacho here is basically the methylation samples and the tomatoes and the cucumbers and the garlic and so on. These are the different cell types that we have. So this is kind of a classical set of problems in, mach in machine learning or in statistics, which is uh, uh, mixture problems or, or uh, one way to, to pose these problems is uh, as matrix factorization problems. So you have a matrix X, which in our case, that's going to be the methylation matrix that I showed you before. And you want to write it as a product of two uh, matrices that uh, are of low rank, or actually one of them is rectangular. So you think about one of them as just the cell type composition, basically. If let's say that you have six cell types. So you're going to have k equals 6 in this case. And n is going to be the number of individuals. And then you have a, mat a long matrix, uh, or kind of a wide matrix z, which will correspond to the different cell types, to the k cell types. And each of the cell types will have a pattern that basically tells you what is the typical methylation that you have in that cell type. And uh, so you can, there's many different ways of thinking about matrix uh, factorization. If you think about it, when you look at any position uh, in any entry in, in our matrix, that basically, this matrix is just a scalar product of this, uh, this row and this column, which essentially what it is is just kind of a mixture of uh, k different numbers, right? So k different z numbers, basic, uh, which are the typical methylation levels. PCA, which you know, some of you probably have seen this kind of uh, uh, figure. PCA that is used a lot in population genetics or in statistical genetics is just one example for these kind of matrix uh, the, uh, factorization problems. There's many other ones like non-negative matrix factorization. And in methylation, people tried everything, I think. So there's uh, quite a lot, and the list goes on. I think there's dozens or hundreds of different methods that are basically trying to do this in different ways. Some of them, uh, some of the papers here are ours, and I'm going to talk about some of those. Uh, and, um, and there's really two different ways. One of them is a supervised approach, and typically the supervised approach basically assumes that Z is given, and you can go to, uh, you can sort the cells, 
and then run methylation on each of the sorted cells. And people have done this, but this is very exp expensive because you, if you do this, then let's say if you have six cell types, then you have to run methylation. Uh, the cost is six times more, basically. Uh, and so it's not the, the, the largest data set that is out there consists of six samples. Uh, they're all males. And, um, you know, and it's only six cell types. There is no, uh, there's no division into a more kind of granular definition of cell types and so on. The other approach is an unsupervised uh, approach, and this is what I'm going to talk about today. And, and the first thing that people would try uh, is PCA. And I'm going to talk about the kind of a variant of PCA that we developed. Uh, and I want to kind of remind you one way of looking at PCA in terms of uh, um, a probabilistic thinking of PCA. So one, one uh, point of view of PCA is that you can think of a matrix, or actually SVD. Uh, in this in this case, so um, you can think of a matrix that the matrix that you get, which is the one here in the left, I don't know if, yeah, the one here in the left, uh, you can think of it as a sum of two matrices. One of the matrices is a low rank matrix, and the other one is just a random matrix. So, for those of you who know the Bishop tipping model, this is basically essentially what it is. Uh, but it doesn't really matter. What what you're really interested in is this low rank matrix over there that you see. And one of the nice things about PCA or SVD is that it, you're guaranteed that the low rank approximation, the best low rank approximation for a matrix is going to be given by the SVD. And, but when you think about it, it's the low rank approximation of the matrix on the left here. But you're interested on the, in, in this matrix, in the signal matrix. The low rank approximation of the signal matrix, the best low rank approximation of the signal matrix is the signal matrix itself because it's low rank, right? The issue is you don't, in terms of information, maybe you don't have enough information to infer it, but basically if, if you, the, the young eckert theorem, which basically tells you that the, the low rank approximation is the one on the left, is not interesting here because really what we want to know is what is the, this matrix here? Now, in methylation, we observe that this is actually not exactly uh, the case. So this model that every position in the genome is kind of contributes the same way is not very useful here. Uh, because it's not, it doesn't really make sense that every position or every gene in the genome is going to be different between different cell types. Uh, and what we observe, and, and, and others as well, that just a, s a small part of the genome, a few, a few percent of the genome are uh, different between the different cell types. And really the picture is what you see below, which is just a small s uh, number of methylation sites that are the low rank, uh, low rank matrix. The, the signal here is kind of sparse, very sparse. And so this is the matrix that you actually get. So this gives a very simple algorithm. Uh, you take the matrix M, so this is your methylation matrix. You run SVD. Uh, and you find a low rank approximation M tilde. And then you look at every column and you look at the correlation between the original matrix and the matrix that the low rank approximation of the matrix. And if you think about it, if you go back to, the, to this figure here, any column which is on the right side here is going to be essentially a low rank approximation of noise. So it's going to, be, uh, to have a very low, uh, it, should be, it should have a, a zero correlation. Any column here will have some signal, and therefore the correlation is, is going to be uh, hopefully non-zero. And that's the idea. And then you take the top T columns, and what is T? That's, uh, you can use cross-validation, but in practice this is something that we do based on uh, biological knowledge in the case of methylation. We know kind of what's the typical number of methylation sites that are going to be different between different cell types. And then you just run PCA on these T columns. Uh, there are some theoretical guarantees that we, we proved, and I'm not going to get into those. I just wanted to mention that this is not just a, a complete heuristic. Uh, for those of you who know the johnson Liu algorithm uh, from Ian Johnston in Stanford for, uh, from about 10 years ago for, for sparse uh, PCA, then basically we show that we, do, we get better results than what they got. In, uh, they show that basically that they are consistent, that, they get, that uh, when you go... Uh, uh, 
to infinity. When you approach infinity, then you get consistently the, uh, the PCs. So we also have that. We're going to get the PCs consistently. Uh, but we also show that if we, if we get, uh, if we look at the signal matrix, then refactor our method is going to give you, with high probability, um, a, a closer matrix in Frobenius norm terms to, uh, to the original matrix, original uh, signal matrix compared to just SVD. OK, so this, it, this works really well in practice, at least in methylation data. Uh, because probably the signal over there is really sparse. And what, we, what I show you here is what is the, the x-axis here is always the number of components that we use in the, in the sparse PCA. And the y-axis is, is the correlation between uh, the cell counts in a data set that we have the, true, the ground truth. Over there we have the cell counts and the estimated cell counts based on these components. And you, you can see that what we have that what we get is uh, consistently better than PCA factor analysis and peer, which is a method that may, many people use in gene expression. Uh, we also have a Bayesian framework for this, um, for this problem using some, essentially we use a refactor and on top of this we use uh, uh, some Bayesian assumptions uh, and a few other modification, but uh, generally, what you see here is that the Bayesian assumption basically has to make some assumption what you, uh, what, on something that you know about the data. So for instance, you can know maybe the distribution of cell counts in the population. And one way to do this is to go to, we went to the medical records here in UCLA and we saw uh, what is the distribution of the cell counts in the, in the uh, patient population. Uh, but you can also sometimes maybe you, you have 10 individuals that you did do, do the cell counts out, out of your entire set of, uh, uh, out of your entire sample size. Uh, and that gives you really good results in terms of correlation of, uh, between your estimated um, cell counts and your actual cell counts. Now, all of this is great, but what we've done is we basically just estimated what is the fraction of each of the cell counts in my sample. But really, bio biology is really cell-specific. We don't really believe that things are basically happen uh, differently, uh, uh, the same way in, in, uh, in all of the uh, cells in our, in our tissue or all of the cells in our, um, all, even in, uh, within the same cell. And what you can see here is a figure that basically shows, this is not, that's from a, uh, one of these papers, I forget which one, but basically that shows that if you look at a, a specific SNP and you look at different cell types then the dist and, and then you look at the gene expression for that SNP, then that gene expression is going to behave differently in the different, um, in the, in different cell, cell types. And you wouldn't see this when you basically look at the, at the original data, which when you look at the bulk. So let me give you an example with methylation. So let's say that we have three different cell types. Cell one, cell type one, two, and three. And let's say that we have cases and controls like you see here. And the uh, colors here correspond to how much of the, uh, how much methylation do you have in, let's say, in a certain position uh, for each of the cell types and for each of the individuals. Now you can easily see that there's a difference between the cases and the controls in this kind of toy example in between the, uh, within cell type number three. But there's, if you look at the data that you actually consider, and the, that data is a mixture of these three cell types. And that mixture is different <coughs> for each individual because every individual has a different cell type composition. And so what you're going to get is this set of cases and controls and these averages. And now you don't really see anything because it's masked by these two cell types and by this information here. And so, you know, sometimes if you have a large enough sample size, maybe you're going to be able to detect some small differences because of, uh, because of the third cell type. But you lose a lot of power when you don't model it. So one way you can go about it is to run what we call single cell sequencing. And many people are basically trying to think about this way. So I stole this from the internet somewhere. This is not a figure that I made. Uh, so, uh, but basically the idea is, uh, that in single, what we do usually is we measure the average uh, of the of methylation across all cell types, or, or RNA if we do it in RNA. 
but what you really want to do is look at each of the cells, and for each of the cells measure the RNA in that cell. And so people do this, but the thing is, for, first of all, for methylation, it doesn't really work, definitely not large scale. It's, you know, people maybe do one or two samples. For RNA, it costs a few thousand dollars per sample. So you can't really do large samples for this. So it would be great if we could do this in, you know, basically emulate this, uh, this thing in, or this process in the computer, which is what we, I'm going to show now. We call this tensor composition analysis. And the basic idea is we get these observed uh, methylations that are across, that are averaged across everything. So we get the soup, and we want to know what is the methylation level in each of these. So we don't want to know only that we have tomatoes and cucumbers. We want to know which type of tomatoes. OK, so this process would emulate the following thing. You sort the cell. And then you measure whole, uh, whole genome methylation for each of the cell types. And, and then basically you have these three different cell types. So there is really no need for single cell sequencing if you do this and you're interested in the cell types. If you're in still interested in the cell level, just one single cell level, that's a different story. So in TCA, one, of the, uh, kind of one way to illustrate the difference between what we do and, and uh, what previous methods did, including what I showed you before, is that traditional decomposition methods basically just give you two matrices, this product of two matrices that I showed you in the beginning. What we give you here is uh, this matrix on the left, which is the same as before. It's just, this is just going to be the cell counts for every individual. And then for every individual, we're going to have a different matrix that will give you what is, what are the, uh, for every cell type and for every methylation position, what is the uh, methylation level in that cell type, in, the, in that position, in that cell type, in that individual? So it's really a tensor because we have, it's not a matrix because we have three dimensions. Okay, so this is obviously you start with number of individuals by number of methylation sites and you get, so that's your input and your output is much bigger. So you have to come up with uh, so in a sense, that's impossible, right? Because you basically come up with new numbers, um, more information than what you actually started with. But I'll show you an intuition why this is actually potentially possible. So think about kind of a simple case where you have the methylation level is 70% in the bulk. So bulk, basically, that's in the soup. Uh, but you have two different cell types. And, um, the frequencies of these cell types, let's say that you know that there are 10% and 90%. Okay, you, did, you ran the cell counts and you know exactly what it is. So one option is to assume that both of them, which is the typical option, is that both of them, that, that people make, is that both of them have 70% methylation level. And that would give you a bulk methylation level of 70%. But if you think about, and I'm making another kind of simplistic assumption here, that both of them have a normal distribution and actually that both of them have the same normal distribution in terms of methylation. So that basically means that the likelihood of observing this, if I just take the product of the two uh, probability densities, is just 0.25. It's 0.5 squared because this one here is 0.5 and this one here is 0.5, okay? But what I can do is move this point here a little bit to the right to 0.71, so just slightly, 0.7 plus epsilon, and then move this one much more to the left OK? The weighted sum is still going to be 0.7, because I take 90% of this and then 10% of this. But the likelihood is going to be much better now. OK? So you have additional information if you make assumptions. So the assumptions that we made here are that we have two normal distributions. We, ha we made here more, more assumptions, actually, just for the sake of the presentation. But in practice, that's what we do. We make uh, some more assumptions that we hope that are going to be reasonable assumptions. So the model that we have uh, is kind of given in this figure. And I'm not going to go over the whole thing here. But basically, uh, what we, we assume that noise is coming from some point, And then the cell composition is going, coming from some point, And then we just add them together. And then one thing that is the main thing that is different between what we did and what previous method did is that we assume that the, this matrix on the right, this matrix Z that I showed you before, uh, 
is really a distribution. Okay, so un unlike the previous method, the basically pre previous method assumed that this is constant, that all the individuals have the same, if you take an, uh, uh, an arbitrary individual and you look at a, s a specific position and a specific cell type, they have the same methylation level. And what we assume is that it's coming from a distribution and actually we're assuming that it's coming from a normal distribution because we don't have much more information. So I want to get to the second story. I'll just tell you briefly that using this, we ran it on uh, two different, uh, a, a bunch of data sets, but two, two different uh, uh, cases. One of them is for immune system, just uh, looking at the phenotype as the cell count itself. And we found uh, a bunch of new associations between, um, between immune system or immune activity and a specific cell type of uh, methylation. And we also ran it on rheumatoid arthritis, which is a relatively common disease. And we found 15 novel associations, and we replicated those uh, in sorted cells. So we have, uh, uh, at least for some of the cell types, we have so, uh, access to sorted cells, and we ran the analysis over there. So going back to the soup, I want to give you another example of, uh, so this, this was kind of the methylation part. And I'm going to give you 10 minutes now about another type of soup, which is the microbiome. So when you think about microbiome studies, in bi microbiome studies what we have is uh, in actually every sample that we'll, we'll take here in the, on the desk or from our body is going to have a lot of different uh, bacteria and uh, microbes that are basically um, that, that co uh, compose this, uh, this sample. Uh, there is uh, a lot of studies in the last few years that basically take samples from different places. Many of them are gut microbiome, but it doesn't only have to be, but this picture is from gut microbiome. Uh, and so, uh, but eventually what we, get, what we get is kind of the same thing. We get a matrix that the, uh, the rows are the samples, and the columns, in this case, are the taxa, basically the species that of bacteria. Uh, so we have, it's usually just counts, basically how many times did we observe this, this taxa. Okay, so this could be, just to give you an idea, this could be an 80,000 uh, taxa and the number of individuals typically is relatively small because it's going to be expensive to do uh, too many of those. So maybe dozens or hundreds or in some cases uh, more. So there's really good reasons to, to study uh, microbiome and I'll just give quickly a couple of examples. So it was used to show that uh, uh, if you t that some sweeteners, um, artificial sweeteners actually induce uh, glucose intolerance and that can uh, basically uh, probably, or at least it was claimed in the paper that that goes through the changes in gut microbiome. They show that there is a change in mi gut microbiome. They show that uh, it induces glucose intolerance. The question is if there's no confounders, but that's a question for later. Um, there's also an interesting, uh, potentially interesting applications in, in medicine so this is actually a, pre, a pretty, I mean, not too old, but 2006, so more than 10 years ago, a study where they, they took uh, uh, germ-free mice and they, uh, they added basically a um, microbiome from obese mice, and then the, the lean mice became obese, so it can actually affect your phenotype. There's causality over there. Uh, and this is actually something that people uh, have shown multiple times. Uh, that in some cases, there are some uh, conditions. For instance, there is a, a, a bacteria called C. difficile, uh, which is it's, it's deadly in the sense that um, a lot of the antibiotics don't work on this, at least on some of the uh, uh, strains of, the, of this. And then one of, the, one of the ways that works really well is to give uh, the patients fecal transplant. Uh, and that works in 90% of the cases. So this is pretty common. There's in 2015, there were 500,000 people that, uh, that were infected and about 20,000 people that died from C. difficile. So it's not something that happens in one in a million. It's, it's much more common than that. So uh, what I'm, I'm going to show you briefly now is another project which basically takes the soup and tries to find out what are the parts of the soup. And in this case, we're looking at what we call source tracking. Microbial source tracking is you can just think about a sample, which is these flip-flops. 
And uh, we, we try to find out what are the different sources, samples that basically can contribute to this, to these flip-flops. So you can <laughs> think about it this way. You have uh, a distribution of the taxa in the flip-flops, and you want to find that 50% came from the feet and 50% uh, came from the soil in this case. There's different uses for this. Uh, um, the original use, uh, use case was contamination, but there's also other uses, for instance, trying to understand how the composition of uh, the bacteria is basically, or the microbiome is changing over time. There's a method called source tracker that uh, was published in 2011 that everybody uses. And this paper, this method uh, uses um, MCMC, Markov Chain Monte Carlo. It's pretty slow. And when we try to, to use it in our, on our data, it just never finished. So we, j we had to stop it. And then we had to write something else that would work uh, uh, potentially better. And it, and it does. So I'm going to skip a couple of slides. But basically, it's, it's been used quite a lot. And uh, I'll tell you about a new method that we developed, which is called FIST. And in that method, the input is, again, basically the soup. But we also have this is uh, supervised to some extent in the sense that we have some information about some of the potential sources. For each of the sources, we have the taxa distribution in that source. So the model that we have is a pretty simple model. It basically just assumes that we have a, a distribution beta in, in our sink sample, and then we have distributions gammas for each of the source samples, and we have some distribution that just sums up to one, alpha, of how much did each of these contribute to the sink. We just assume that there is a linear model here, so basically that each of the betas is just a linear combination of, uh, of the sources. Now, one of the things that we add is we basically assume that these, this, the data that we observe, we remember these are counts. Uh, we assume that this comes from a multinomial distribution. And so we uh, explicitly model the noise. And that's true all, both for the, uh, for the uh, sink and the sources. And then we also add some unknowns. So there could be an unknown source that we don't know. We don't observe anything about this one. But we add this one. So there's some differences between what, did, what we did and what uh, source tracker. I'm going to skip most of it. But basically, the, I think the main thing is that we used expectation maximization. They used EM, which makes our method much, much faster. But also, our model is a bit different. And it's more, it includes a little bit more. It's, it's more you know, inclu includes the noise, for instance. And I think some of the things that they added maybe are not necessarily that useful. Uh, in terms of the statistically useful. So this is the running time comparisons between what we did and what they did, which is not surprising, MCMC compared to EM. But this is log scale. It's about 100 times faster. So it makes it, it, makes it uh, feasible in many cases where it's not feasible to run it with source tracker. Uh, but it's not only faster. It's also much better in terms of performance, in terms of the statistical performance, so how accurate it is. So you can see here random forest. Uh, source tracker, which is the other method, and FIST, which is us. And then what you see on the y-axis is the r-square, which is basically the correlation between the true sources and the predicted sources. And what you see here is the x-axis is how similar are the sources to each other. So there's, uh, the performance depends on how similar they are to each other. One of the things that we noted, we kind of noticed that is very different between what we do and what they do. Uh, is that if we try to add to this simulation an unknown, then uh, we get not exactly the unknown contribution, but very close. And they have a very biased estimate of the unknown. And again, you just have to remember that hundreds of different studies were using this source tracker, uh, this, this uh, second method. And all of them basically essentially just assumed that there is no unknown because of that. So. Um, in two minutes, I'll give you a, a couple of examples of what we, uh, what we did. So there's a, a few examples that we have in the paper uh, that, that show how you can use our method or why it, on real data. One of them is this example here, where you, you have um, children that are basically uh, being followed from birth all the way to 12 months. 
And you have samples when at birth, at four months and 12 months, and you also have samples from the mother. And these children, some of them are vaginally birthed, and some of them are C-section birthed, some of them are bottle fed, fed and some of them are breastfed. You want to see how uh, the, the, the idea of the study was to see how the uh, uh, microbiome changes over time. And what you, what you can see here in this, these two figures is the, on the left, you see the difference between the C-section and the vaginally delivered. This is, we take uh, babies that are at 12 months and we ask what is the, the contribution that we get from uh, the mothers from the, from the, and from the babies, okay? And you can see that in both cases, both the vaginal and the C-section, the mothers essentially give you quite a lot. Uh, but when you look at the C-section, there's also quite a lot of unknown, okay, that basically comes, uh, comes in. And if you took source structure, you wouldn't see this because the unknown would be zero. Uh, the mother is still typically, you know, what you see on the right is just a distribution. If you took the rank of, uh, for each of the individual, where does the mother uh, uh, sit, like in terms of like the ranking, and you take the median of this, so that would be on the right is the distribution of the uh, of of the where the mother is, and you see that it should be by chance just about seventy, but we see that it's all it's the majority of the time it's number one. So the mother is the main contributor. Okay, one more example. Uh, we took individuals that are ICU patients uh, and compare them to healthy controls. And in this case, we basically we took 100 cases, 100 ICU and 100 controls. These are the sinks and the sources are, this is actually the, the there's a problem with the, it's not the, uh, the final slide, but basically the sources are just healthy uh, controls. And what you can see is that you, you look in the distribution of the sources in the cases and in the controls, in the ICU patients and in the controls, and you try to classify them. And what you can see on the right is a rock curve that basically shows you what the source tracker do, uh, what do they do in terms of the performance, and it's a bit more than just random, but not, not much more, and where we are, which is about here. And then uh, break curtis is a different kind of approach that basically looks at similarity uh, that we kind of added here. Uh, but the basic idea here is that, there is that you could potentially use this method for classification between uh, cases and controls, or essentially phenotype classification. Of course, these cases and controls, just as a caveat here, they, they came from different studies, so it could be confounders. So you could otherwise basically just use this as a method to find, con find confounders. So it really depends on what the result is. In any case, source tracker doesn't give you this. So, Okay, so I'll just summarize quickly. Um, Basically, heterogene heterogeneous tissues are all over the place, really, when we think about uh, uh, genomics and biology. Uh, and uh, averaging, which is what we've done so far because of uh, kind of uh, technical limitations, is useful, but it's obviously not the best thing we can do. One way to go again, uh, to go to, uh, one thing we can do about it is to improve the technologies, like single cell, but and then I think maybe, you know, 10 years from now, maybe a single cell or maybe 20 years uh, is going to be cheap enough so that you can do hundreds of thousands of samples with single cell. But it doesn't seem like that's going to be the case in the next few years, at least for some of the technologies, definitely for methylation. <coughs> uh, and then uh, while we can't do this, we can still do things in silico, basically, and kind of try to emulate this, is, which is what we try to do uh, here. So... With that, I'm going to finish, and I wanted to uh, thank uh, a bunch of my collaborators here that are listed in these papers, uh, including Elazar and Noah Zaitlin, who's here, and I'm probably missing, uh, and mainly my students, Elior, who's there, who led all of the, you can say hi, and then uh, who led all the uh, papers that I told you about the methylation, and Liat, who's also here. Uh, who led the, um, the papers that are, well, in this case, we only told you about one paper that is basically related to the microbiome. And uh, thank you all for your attention. And, um, thank you.
Yes. Yes, you do. You do lose the interpretation, and that's why we kind of added the Bayesian framework. So the basic idea is that uh, th the problem is that if you take, if you just go, I, I'm just going to kind of repeat the question, but also show the, the figure. It's, it's a while back. But basically, what we had over there, I talked about the matrix factorization. You have mixtures of columns of axes that are unintuitive. Right. So we have a matrix factorization, and then we, have the, we write it as w times z. And when you think about PCA or any of these methods, including refactor, non-matrix factorization, all these, this is, it gives you some kind of, uh, up to, let's say, linear transformation, it's basically, you, you get some, some result, but up to linear transformation, you can't really know if the W is the real W of the cell types, or it's a kind of a transformation of this. One thing you can do, which is what I kind of showed really briefly in the Bayesian framework, is basically say, well, if I know something else, let's say if I know what is the typical uh, cell type in, a, in an individual, uh, and I don't need genomic data for this. I just need to take the cell counts, which is really, it's much easier to get just the cell counts compared to cell counts and the genomic, because genomic is much more expensive. So then I can take that, this, all the possible kind of transformation and basically just choose one that would give me the closest thing to, to what I see from the... Uh, so, but wouldn't a independence criteria, as opposed to a correlation criteria, so some type of uh, uh, information, or ICA, so the question is if you if you care about the independent factors if you okay so if you if you think about what we find here here we actually find what is the uh, we estimate for each cell type what is the um, uh, what is the fraction of that cell type right what we find here is some kind of a transformation of this Sometimes just finding what is the transformation is, of this is good enough. For instance, if you use linear regression, you don't care about the fact that, it's, that there is some linear transformation that would bring you to the, to the truth. So you can find uh, some independent factors, but it doesn't really matter. The entire space of linear transformation is the same. If you care about the exactly finding for every cell type what is the fraction of that cell type in every individual, then you want to do something like that. And I think for that you would need, you would need some semi-supervised approach that would tell you something about what, uh, what is the typical thing. But uh, yeah, I can't really imagine that you, you can't use any information and then and get this. And even for this, this is, uh, if, the two cell, if you, there's two cell types that are highly correlated in terms of the fractions in the population, then you might get confused. Okay, thank you, Great, right?